conference. Thank you very much, Debbie. I also just wanted a chance to stand up here and, and welcome you all uh, and thank you all for coming. I think the breadth and depth of the people here uh, is going to make this a pretty exciting day. Um, focusing on financial products and policies for an aging population uh, was motivated amongst the CFP possible topics we could have done because I think it's one of the most um, the main challenge is probably facing a very broad range of governments from the developed and even less developed world uh, as populations age. So how do they provide financial security for a population that is increasingly elderly and retired bears on questions of private market saving, public market regulation, and public market saving programs also. It's such a big problem, it's such a widespread issue to challenge, to tackle, that the idea that this would be a solution that comes merely from the private sector or merely from the government seems wrong, that there must be coordinated efforts. And then there also seemed to be a large amount of new research areas that, that we're touching on, on the, this topic and that should be getting out there and integrated into policy thinking, into the private sector's thinking about how to develop these tools and products. So without further ado, the first um, session we have is on behavioral finance, bringing richer models of human behavior into understanding, modeling, and defining the implications of different retirement approaches to retirement savings. So thank you. Our first speaker is, is John Bashir from Harvard. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present today. I'm going to tell you about a stream of research, a series of papers that I've been working on with James Choi, um, who has uh, been around this conference, uh, David Labson and Bridget Madrian. Various subsets of the papers also involve as co-authors Chris Clayton, Chris Harris, and Josh Hurwitz. So uh, this is our joint research, although if I start to editorialize and, and, uh, and, and go off stating my opinions, I just want to uh, state up front that that's, uh, that's, that's my uh, view of things and uh, I don't want to necessarily implicate uh, all the other people who are on this slide, okay? But um, let me actually start by presenting a fact from a different set of authors. This is from Argento, Bryant, and Sable House. And what they did was, um, it took a lot of work, but in some sense, conceptually, it's quite, quite straightforward. They looked at all U.S. households under the age of 55 and they tallied up how much are those households making withdrawals from defined contribution retirement savings plans, 401ks, IRAs, et cetera, okay? And they tally that up, and what they found is quite striking. They found that for every dollar that is going into 401ks and IRAs in the form of contributions, there's about 40 cents coming out in the opposite direction in the form of pre-retirement taxable withdrawals. And that's a major offset for the flow in and has potentially very large consequences for retirement security. Now, how is that happening kind of mechanically? Well, the way the US system works is, let's say you have balances in an employer's 401k plan. As soon as you leave that employer, that money is accessible to you. You can take a direct withdrawal, just like withdrawing cash almost, uh, or you can roll it over to an IRA. As soon as it's in an IRA, you can really withdraw it at any time. The only thing that happens then is you pay some taxes on the withdrawal, and you also have to pay a 10% tax penalty, although there are various circumstances under which you can avoid that 10% tax penalty. Now, I'm going to focus today on that 10% number. That's a policy lever. It's uh, under our control collectively as, uh, as, as citizens of the, of the United States. Uh, it's under direct control of the, uh, of the federal government. And what that number governs is the, the liquidity of the defined contribution retirement savings system. And all I mean by that is how easy or how costly it is to access your retirement funds before you reach retirement age. And the question I'm gonna put forward is, what is the socially optimal level of liquidity? Um, I'll admit up front, I can't uh, give you a precise number at the end of this talk, but hopefully I'll give you a few ways of, of thinking about the socially optimal level of liquidity. And the key trade-off I'm gonna be grappling with is as follows. So on the one hand, liquidity is good. It's desirable be because people face negative shocks, maybe they have a job loss, maybe they have medical bills to pay, and being able to withdraw from your retirement savings helps you smooth over those shocks. 
On the other hand, and this is the behavioral finance angle, people may have self-control problems, they may spend more than they had planned to, they may fail to plan appropriately for retirement, and in that situation, unfortunately, you may have under-saving because people can access their, their retire, retirement savings before reaching retirement age, okay? So that's the trade-off I have in mind. As a first step, towards sort of understanding what the socially optimal level of liquidity might be, I'm gonna ask, how did other countries besides the United States approach this problem, okay? So we're gonna do an international comparison for, uh, to, to get things going. We're gonna look at five other countries. So we're gonna take the US, the other four largest, meaning richest kind of uh, countries with, uh, with English as an official language. And then we're also going to try to branch a little bit outside of the English-speaking world, and we're going to go to Germany, which is the largest economy with a uh, richest economy with a kind of meaningful defined contribution system. Japan turns out not to have a lot of defined contribution savings. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare liquidity across these countries. And the number that is going to summarize liquidity is what I'll call a marginal rate of transformation. And all that's saying is how easy or how costly is it to transfer withdrawal funded consumption in retirement to withdrawal con funded consumption today before retirement. And what I want you to have in mind is this, uh, this ratio here. It's, um, let, me, let me explain what's going on. What, what's happening is you can think of having a dollar in a pre-tax retirement account, one option you have is to withdraw that dollar today before you reach retirement age. How much consumption is that going to buy you? That's one minus your tax rate pre-retirement, okay? And then the other option you have is you can withdraw that dollar when you reach retirement. How much consumption is that going to buy you in retirement? Well, it's one minus your tax rate when you are eligible for retirement withdrawal, so when you're, you're at retirement age. And the ratio between those two is going to tell you, well, how much pre-retirement consumption do you get per unit of in-retirement consumption that you're sacrificing? Okay, so that's telling you how much can you um, transfer consumption from retirement to now, how kind of easy or costly is that? The whys that we have here, you of course have to recognize that tax rates are contingent on income. The big why we want to think of as your permanent income in retirement. We're gonna assume that people are actually um, at sort of the median of, of these various countries' income distributions. So think of, of households with uh, 60,000 US dollars in, in annual income. We're gonna say in retirement, that's your income level. Prior to retirement, we're gonna contemplate the possibility that you actually have uh, lower income. So maybe you're experiencing a negative income shock. And the little y is going to measure how large in magnitude is that negative income shock. All right, and what that allows us to do is for all these countries draw pictures which look a little bit like this. I'm showing you Canada right now. The marginal rate of transformation I was talking about a moment ago is on the vertical axis. The magnitude of the reduction in, in income today, that little y is on the horizontal axis. And what the picture is telling us is that for small negative shocks to income in Canada, the marginal rate of transformation, we're gonna call it zero. And the reason is you're actually not allowed to withdraw from your retirement savings plan in Canada if you only experience a small negative income shock. All right, now, if you have a large negative income shock, as, as soon as your income falls below a threshold, all of a sudden there's a, a rule, a, a, an exception which is made, you can start withdrawing from your uh, retirement savings plan before you reach retirement age. And so this marginal rate of transformation jumps up actually above one and continues to rise as your negative income shock becomes more severe. So there, in a way, there's a, there's a stronger and stronger incentive for you to withdraw when you're experiencing these negative income shocks, which makes sense. I mean, that's a really nice time to uh, be able to, to, to withdraw from your, your retirement account. The picture for Australia looks similar for small reductions in, uh, in income. You're not allowed to withdraw from your superannuation fund as soon as you experience uh, at least 26, one, 26 weeks of unemployment, you're gonna start to be able to withdraw from your retirement savings plan. Actually, the, uh, the pictures for Germany, Singapore, and the United Kingdom are quite boring, so I'm gonna show them all in one slide. You're essentially not allowed to withdraw early from retirement uh, savings plans, although, uh, an important caveat to apply here and with the previous pictures is I'm contemplating withdrawals just for general consumption. Um, so maybe you want to um, take a vacation, maybe you want to throw a party for yourself or something like that. All of these countries have an additional exception if, for example, you become disabled. 
uh, then you can access your retirement fund. Or in Australia and uh, in Canada, you can also make withdrawals to cover housing payments. You can also make withdrawals to cover medical expenses. Singapore actually is the one where I need to apply the most caveats. In Singapore, you can withdraw um, certainly under uh, when you become disabled. You can also withdraw for housing expenses, medical expenses, education expenses. Singaporeans tend to take a lot of withdrawals for housing purposes, and so they end up quite uh, house rich and perhaps without a lot of financial assets by the time, by the time they get to, to retirement. But, but by and large, um, this, uh, this, this story I'm telling you is, is, is painting a picture that it's not so easy to get your retirement savings just for general arbitrary consumption purposes in these, in these five cu countries. Here's the picture for the United States, and we'll focus on Texas um, just because you need to take state income taxes into account. In the United States, even when you're not experiencing a negative income shock, so long as you have some balances in an IRA, you're going to be able to withdraw, you're going to be able to access those and spend it on whatever you want. Uh, you don't even need to have a special purpose, you don't need to explain it to anyone, you can just withdraw the money and start consuming, go on the trip that you've been, uh, you've been dying to go on. Okay? And I think what the comparison between the US and the other five countries suggests is that you know, there's an important question out here, why are these different countries reaching such different answers to the question of what's the optimal level of, of liquidity in the retirement savings system. So I'm going to turn now to a theoretical analysis, which will help us kind of illustrate what, um, what a simple model of the trade-off I started with is, is going to call for here. So let's, um, let's do what we call mechanism design. We're going to think of a model of household behavior, how our uh, household behaving over, over the life cycle. Then we're going to say the policymaker has some sort of objective, which, which may not be perfectly aligned with uh, the household's behavior. And then we say, how is the policymaker going to design institutions in order to maximize the policymaker's objective function, but conditional on the, uh, the model of household behavior. So let me go into some of the details here. We have a simple model in mind which captures all the dynamics that we're interested in. There are three periods. At the beginning, in this first period, the policymaker is going to set up the retirement savings system. So this is the, the point where the policymaker makes its move, if you will. And then uh, the household gets to uh, live its life. The household has two major phases. One, think of as working life, where you're able to consume, perhaps you're subject to uh, negative income shocks. And then there's a retirement phase where you're also going to want to consume. Now, the key trade-off in the model is exactly the trade-off that I, that I started with. On the one hand, maybe these negative income shocks, which we're going to model as short-run taste shocks affecting the marginal utility of consumption, Maybe those are things that will push us to give the household flexibility and a lot of liquidity in the savings systems. On the other hand, the household is going to have a behavioral bias. The household is going to suffer from present bias, and Alessandro is going to talk a little bit more about why uh, this, is, this is an important factor and a, and a reasonable assumption. Um, but for now, we're going to take it as, as given. Households uh, have present bias. What does that mean? It means that they place disproportionately high weight on consumption and all utility flows in the present moment and low weight on everything that's happening in the future. So if we think of a standard model of household behavior, we often give them an exponential discount function. So utility flows today get a weight of one, utility flows next year get a weight of maybe 99%, so 0.99, utility flows the year after that, 0.99 squared, and so there's an exponential decay of the weights that you place on utility flows as, as time goes forward. With present bias, you don't use this smooth exponential discount and you treat today as somehow very special. So today gets a weight of one, whereas next year gets not just the delta factor applied to it, this 99% factor applied to it, or 0.99. There's an additional factor, which we call beta. That's a little bit of lingo. Uh, beta between zero and one. Think of it maybe as two thirds, significantly pushing down the weight that we place on, uh, on next year's consumption and all future years of consumption have that down weight on them. Okay? Now the, the policymaker doesn't think it's appropriate to have this desire for immediate gratification. Um, it, think of it as a self-control problem. The policymaker thinks, 
when households consume so much today, that's partly because they're responding to, to the taste shocks, but it's partly because they're over consuming relative to what would be normatively optimal. So the policymaker is going to use an exponential discount function, the 1, 0 0.99, 0 0.99 squared, et cetera, and is going to kind of recognize that there may be heterogeneity in the degree of present bias. Different households may have different levels of beta, so they may uh, have differences in the extent to which they place disproportionately high weight on, uh, on today. And in terms of the institutions that the policymaker is going to uh, set up, well, they're going to distribute resources in a uh, series of financial accounts which have differing levels of liquidity. So they could range from a completely liquid account, think of that as a checking account, to completely illiquid accounts. Think of that more as Social Security and everything in between. So they could place something in what looks like a 401k, 10% penalty on early withdrawals. And uh, just one note on our methods, we're going to use numerical methods for a range of parameter values, a range of taste shock distributions, and, and see in general what, what comes out from that analysis. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, this population of agents. They have different degrees of present bias. The policymaker is choosing the accounts. It turns out beyond the liquid account, beyond the checking account, the next account that the policymaker wants to add is a completely illiquid account. So if you can only choose one extra account beyond the liquid account, you want a completely illiquid one, one with no possibility of early withdrawals during, during working life. And adding that account is going to improve welfare in our, in our uh, calibrations by, uh, by about 3% of wealth. And intuitively what's going on here is you could think of applying a penalty to early withdrawals. The higher the penalty, the more you're helping out the household with a high degree of present bias, with a very low beta resist temptation and, and sort of circumvent their present bias. You could also choose a lower tax penalty on early withdrawals, which would be appropriate for the high beta households, the households with less present bias. But it turns out you want to help the low beta households more. If you choose a tax penalty that's appropriate for the high beta households, the ones with less present bias, the low beta households are going to end up paying a lot of penalties and that hurts them. That hurts them more than it, uh, than it helps the, uh, the high beta households. Here's the interesting part though. Let's say you have the perfectly liquid account, the checking account. Let's say you also have the perfectly illiquid account. Maybe start thinking of that as social security. What's the next account you want to add? It's actually a partially illiquid retirement account with a penalty, and you know it's not going to be exactly 10%, but the penalty seems to hover around 10% across a, a range of numerical simulations that we've done. How much illiquid savings is going in this partially illiquid account? About 15%. Again, that matches the data. Roughly speaking, I don't want to kind of take the calibration too seriously. And there's going to be leakage from this account. In fact, about 50% of the balances are going to leak out ahead of time. Now, this third account, however, has not a very large welfare consequence. So you can kind of take it or leave it um, in, in our model. Adding the third account versus subtracting it changes welfare by only 0.02% of wealth. What does this mean? Um, and here's where uh, maybe I'm starting to editorialize. I think it hinges on whether you think the size of the completely illiquid account, Social Security, is optimal. If you think it's optimal, meaning Social Security is the appropriate size, well then this low penalty, 10% early withdrawal penalty, high leakage retirement count is in fact socially optimal. It's the right supplement that we want um, given this trade-off between, uh, between uh, liquidity and, uh, and illiquidity. But it doesn't have very large welfare consequences that I mentioned just a moment ago. If, however, the completely illiquid account Social Security is smaller than optimal, either on average or for particular subsets of the population, then actually you may want to make the 401k or the IRA completely illiquid because then it serves as an extension of the illiquid account. As you do that, however, you may want to recognize that households use the uh, retirement savings system as a means of smoothing over these short-run shocks like job loss or, or medical bills. So you might also want to take simultaneously moves to boost emergency savings if you're going to make the retirement savings completely illiquid because then the emergency savings can help people smooth over shocks. So um, I'll stop there. I'm going to uh, just leave you with, uh, uh, with the following thought. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity across countries in terms of how they solve this problem, what's the optimal level of, uh, of, of liquidity in the retirement savings system. It begs the question, why is the U.S. so different? Hopefully I've given you a sense that, well, the degree of liquidity you want to choose in the U.S. defined contribution retirement savings system should probably hinge on your views as to whether uh, the, the Social Security system is the right size or, uh, or too small. So uh, thanks very much.